Hello, fella. How are you? <laughs> Good morning, Stasha. Face recognition, maybe? No. <laughs> Hello. Hello. I've been reducing the amount of plastic in my life and especially plastic plane handles so I just turned a new knob on my number four bench plane which I'm really happy with and the rear tote I did a couple of weeks ago and I put it through its trial it feels wonderful and so the, the front tote now the the knob is wonderful too I like the way it came out the end result is a very new looking plane that I really like. This is another experiment I'm driving and I obviously will not look at the camera while I'm driving but I just wondered how it would go so I'm just leaving a private road and I'm on my way home because I have a small task to do for my wife but um, I thought I could spend a little time talking to you while I'm on my way to the timber yard. When I first met George, um, who was the one to greet me when I first stepped through the latch gate of the big door at um, my new employers when I was 15. He was the one that stepped forward, stretched out his hand and welcomed me and said, hi, I'm George, what's your name? And then um, there was something about his smile, about his cleft chin and his bright blue eyes and then his height as well that really impacted me because what I was looking at was a kind man um, uh, who was youngish, 24, 25 I think at the time and um, he was the one that was going to work with me every day for the next five years so five, six days a week we worked five and a half days a week then I think if I remember rightly and um, which was a 45 hour week and um, he finished his apprenticeship and stayed on there. He'd apprenticed with the same company. And uh, he knew everybody and he knew his craft very, very well. But he was also really, really good at mathematics, algebra, physics, and um, many other elements, geometry. And uh, I wasn't, I'd never been, really been exposed to any of that because, you know, my schooling, you know, wasn't really. Um, inspiring I suppose I, I would try and uh, duck out of different classes and when I started working with George you know I had to start suddenly working in fractions of inches and dividing fractions and things like that so he guided me through all of that and um, steered me and taught me uh, in addition to just woodworking he would teach me algebraic formula he was um, a very uh, inspiring worker really uh, and in addition to that there was the wood of course and the way trees grew and all of those things so I uh, warmed to him straight away and um, we had a social life together somewhat and um, we would go out when I was a little older maybe 17 18 we would meet together and have a pint together and and such and um, we just enjoyed many of the same things you know he was a kind um, gentle 
giant of a man and um, but he, he had a point of view and he was always trying to impress on me uh, elements of life that were of value uh, and um, respect. I think I never saw George disrespectful to anybody and uh, the boss was very hard not to be disrespectful to because he was an out and out proverbial snob. He, he, he was an affluent man um, who had inherited wealth from a working class dad he became the, I mean, the biggest snob I ever met. I, I never found anybody to pass him, really. He was an incredible snob. Whereas George rode a bike in with bike clips on and uh, had his overalls and bib and brace, that kind of thing. And I did the same. I came in on a bike and um, put bike clips on my trousers and stuff like that. There was no lycra back then. <laughs> I, think, I think they would have laughed at you if you'd worn lycra to ride a bike six miles to work. It's kind of commonplace every day. Um, you didn't dress up with the gear. Uh, you just rode a bike. Actually, I used to ride a bike with my tools strapped to the saddle in a bus and um, uh, you know, there was a good 40 pounds worth, 50 pounds in weight of tools strapped to that bike. When I would do work, in addition to my daily work, I would go and work and do what we called foreigners in the evening where we would, um, I don't know, build something, uh, install something in somebody's house, repair something, fix a door, that kind of thing. One time, uh, he and I were working together and the, the lady of the house said, um, uh, I only do, I only want quality work, I don't want any any poor workmanship and he said well you have to weigh up the costs and so on and um, he said for instance you know uh, we're doing dovetails or you can have a neat little brad well punched, well a, a brad was a nail and um, she said well we always go for the best, I'll take the neat little brad well punched and uh, that was his way of getting around. He was joking, of course, but she never understood the joke, but certainly I did. And um, So he had a way of twisting things and uh, making the ordinary seem funny, uh, or was funny. And, uh, you know, he didn't like snobs the same way I didn't like snobs, you know. So he was a great guy. Just coming up to Travis Perkins. It's not a special place really, Travis Perkins, but they generally do have some uh, good pine, uh, which is what I've come here for. Um, their pine is, is usually very nice and fairly not free. I hope I'm as good or as lucky today as I have been in the past, but we'll see. I'm looking for some straight grain clear pine because I'm making a crib and I want the wood to be not free so at the top of here I've got a metre and a half of unclear but this bottom part is as clear as a bell it's very nice so how much can I cut off that? I can cut some off, I can cut off at the knot and uh, the main advantage is it gives me exactly what I want for my crib so I'm going to cut some off this one. Yeah. I want some thicker stock for the legs because I'm going to make this like a sleigh bed on one side. Not too impressive. In fact, not impressive at all. So I may find an alternative. Hmm, I think I'll do that. I'm ready to cut these and I've marked on the end, except this one. 
I don't know why I didn't mark that one. It's like a okay. This is the Thames this morning. Isn't that a stunning picture really? I love it. I love the way the Thames just is like a mill pond right now. Just completely still. That's about itself. Beautiful morning. It is. It's lovely. Yeah. There we go. Yeah. 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 It is a lovely morning, I must say. bird sounds around me and um, it's, it's not just the bird sound it's the light catching through the leaves where you can get the real full color and then the sun changes the color slightly and adds its yellow to it and it's a kaleidoscope the whole of the tree canopy becomes a kaleidoscope of color but then you have shape as well, and you've got texture. So you've got shape, colour, texture, just from being here. And when we just take this time away from our work, away from our computers, away from our desk, even even the gravel trucks in the background, you know, and the, the diggers that are digging the gravel, adds texture and sound. Um, to the environment, good, bad, it depends on what you feel about it, but they're all part of life and that's the important thing for me. I love the colour I'm getting and I'm going to show you some of that colour in a second, but I want to share with you all the time, I, I love this ability, I like what this is doing, it's giving me a place where I can share some of what's happening in my life and I hope it'll help you to maybe take a little time out and get out into the country and see nature. See that is a total composition right there and actually it's the beginning of decomposition where even in decomposition there's an order to it as just as there's an order in composition there's an order in decomposition when things go back to the earth and they start the first stages of decomposition the texture of decomposition the shape of decomposition until it goes back to the earth and then I think these are the amazing things of life really Silhouettes. Sound. Texture. Woo, I just love this. Okay, my friends, quick tour of an area of my workshop that you have not really seen much of yet. 
This is the general view from the top of the step ladders, looking down on the area where we do a lot of different work out here. This is our experimental zone, our um, trialing zone, our checking things out, testing anything from glues to woods to tools, but it's also where everybody has a bench. So this one down here is Izzy's workbench. This is where she does her trialing on joints, joinery, and uh, her um, testing for how her curriculum is working. There's an area just beyond there, that one there with the red grinder on his mine. That's where I check out tools, revamp tools, uh, and things like that. Mostly, these are experimental stations uh, for me. So I don't do this in the garage necessarily, but I often do. There's a bandsaw. One of, I've got two bandsaws that are identical, and I use these for um, dimensioning my wood, but I use the one in the garage. When I'm working on a project for filming, I'll use the one in the garage. This one I'll use for rough cutting, dimensioning wood, getting bigger planks down to smaller planks. And then of course I've got additional wood right at the back there, my wood storage. These are little treasured pockets of wood, as is that one there in the corner. And then there, that black bench is the one I made that looked like I was replicating a vintage bench. That's where Hannah works. And that's her workstation where she has her tools and her bench and then right next to that is a super tall bench that's phil's bench we'll go closer in on that then there's a bench there and there's another bench right behind hannah's bench that i can use so if i get visitors like last week i had some visitors from russia and um i would set them on a bench like that uh, here i have my bicycles i've got two bikes uh, I've got a non-electric one and then I have an electric one which is wonderful if I've got to go a long distance and there are lots of hills this really works very nicely for me uh, because going up the hill is exactly the same as riding on the level you still have to power this bike these boxes and shelves are a recent addition that Joseph and I put together for storing all of the stuff that we've done through the years for woodworking master classes we have kept archives of so we've got tools we've got school tools in there too but this is where we keep all of the stuff we don't want to lose any of it but it brings order to what we do so that's my additional area that i like this is where mark does the shipping so my books go out from here or DVDs as well. And I've got this plywood, which I'm not going to tell you what this is for yet, but it's going to be a super duper project that everybody will like. So that's my key area. I think you'll like it. Um, yeah, I still got these toolboxes. I still keep my special tools in here, the ones that I love and can't just bear to part with. So here, Sliding tool trays with all the bits and bobs I've accumulated, which you do through the years. Carving chisels. And then my long paring chisels, which I like to have, although I don't use them very much. And then this is the workbench you will have seen on my earlier videos before I did the workbench build for YouTube. Here we've got Hannah's workbench space, so this is where she works and um, she's working on a project now that has, so this has got uh, three or four tenons in here, three I believe. Um, so it's a cherry top with maple ends, breadboard ends, and she's working on this for a table for herself. So these are some of her tools, these are the uh, tools that she's uh, acquired through the last two years since she's been with me she's got quite a gathering of tools and um, this is her toolbox I don't know if you remember her making this I don't think she'll mind me showing you in here so there is her treasured possessions all in there so 
from different pockets for all the equipment that she's accumulated over the last two years. It's great really seeing her her things come together. Look at the dovetails on the drawers and the dovetails here. She's very accomplished, very, very accomplished. So let's take a look at the dovetails here. Those her her drawer dovetails. Hi, um I'm out in the park actually, which is quite unusual for me. I'd rather be in the wild wilder places than in the park, but I just wanted to point you in a direction that I found very helpful through the years and that is to start sketching and drawing because you'll find it invaluable to your woodworking. I have and I have been able to express my um, thoughts about uh, a project to other people by drawing and um, as far as I know I never didn't get something that I bid on when I did a drawing and that includes pieces for the White House uh, in the USA and um, two pieces in the cabinet room of the White House came from my direct sketches on pieces of paper that were A4 size and um, I think that my sketches really helped me to get the work and uh, so at the end of the day I look back on my history in woodworking. I've, I did sketches for Phil Graham and his wife for six or seven pieces of furniture where they flew out to visit with me. I did the drawings in front of them and they said go ahead do the work and it translated into many many tens of thousands of pounds worth of work for those people and um, so I'm encouraging you to start drawing. So I've got myself out here I've got my sketchbook, uh, which is also my journal, so I write in here, and um, but I also keep my sketches in here, and these are basic sketches that I use, and actually these these sketches would appear in some of my books now um, that I've written, that not the ones not published even, but are on their way. So get yourself drawing, and and see what you feel. But it doesn't matter if you can't draw, and that's the important message I'm giving you now, is um, if you can't draw, if you believe you can't draw, I'm here to tell you, you probably can. You just have to learn how to express yourself on paper. So I keep a couple of things in my backpack permanently with me, my sketchbook being one of them, my journal is always with me no matter where I go and um, and then I have this little roll here that is very special to me and I keep in this a pencil sharpener I keep a couple of pencils special unique pencils that I use for drawing so this is a koh one that you might like um, it's very nice it has a full lead this is actually a full lead it's all lead here and I use this for shading and sketching and then I have a, a 6B or a 4B pencil, something like that, that will get you out there drawing. I have these little um, uh, small pens that I use, microns, for sketching in black and white, so I keep those too. So little packet like that, sketchbook like this, doesn't have to be fancy. But then you take things like this and you start studying the leaf and you look at the maple leaf and uh, the aspens um, with their uh, five points and you can sketch, you see the veins in the back, you start to understand the leaf structure more, these veins are what transport the liquid and the food to the leaf during its life and then when it starts to rot back it changes colour from green, a darker green to a lime green and then it starts to take on this type of colour as it rots down goes back to the earth uh, you'll end up with the browns and everything else so it's great to start sketching just very simply get the lines on the paper on the page uh, and and you'll be surprised how quickly something like this will come together and it'll give you an understanding of the leaf structure 
uh, you start understanding, you start seeing the veins going through the material just like this. Uh, it gives the shape to the leaf uh, and uh, I, I think this is great. And this is a way you can work with your children too as I did through the years. Um, just uh, to encourage them to see nature for what it really is. And there is my first draft. I'm seeing the veins in here uh, working through the leaf. And as I do this and I put them on the page, I start looking at different elements of it. And, and then I look at the, you see there's the front of my leaf. But then I look at the back of the leaf and this one is much more evident on this one. Here you see the, the fore part of the leaf there. And then you turn it round you see all these wonderful veins in the back. And those veins are telling me that that's where the food is transported to the leaf. That's where it's come up from the stem of the tree, the trunk as we normally know it. <coughs> Goes along the branches and then it fans out again into the veins in the leaf and this is feeding the leaf and then um, of course we've reached a point now when the leaves are no longer being fed it's all done and dusted it's the end of the season we're coming into autumn these leaves are rotting down it's perfect mm -hmm.